Uh, hello and welcome to the Daily Dragonfly. Uh, no, the Dragonfly Daily with Mike. I'm Mike Marsh. I'm the product manager for Dragonfly and the host of this series. So thank you for tuning in. As always, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so we know that you're interested and we know to keep generating content. Now, with that said, today we are on lesson two. Just a quick recap. If you want to tune in live for these, they are broadcast uh, every day live as long as we can keep this going. And uh, these are the times in your local time zones. Now, uh, there will be questions and answers at the very end if you're watching live. So you can ask questions at the end of today's webinar for questions from today. And you can also tune in for tomorrow's live webinar and ask questions uh, just in advance of tomorrow's webinar. If you have follow-up questions you want to ask offline, please submit them to the forums and please uh, take advantage of the forums and be available to help each other out. We have a couple hundred people. A lot of these are a lot of you academic users that don't necessarily have a support plan. It would be great if you might band together and be available to help each other out answering some of your questions. Now the scope of this week's lessons. Yesterday we did working with Image Data Live and we also have already posted lesson 0 0.1 downloading and installing Dragonfly. If you haven't done that, this will tell you how to get started. And we're on to lesson two, working with meshes. Again, uh, if you like the lesson, go ahead and hit like on YouTube. Just a quick reminder, the lessons are starting basic, but they're gonna progress uh, very quickly to more advanced topics, so stay tuned. And the material will seem very rushed, but that's just so that it's nice, small, and encapsulated and available on YouTube, so you don't have to spend you know, an hour watching to get to the point. Lesson two, working with meshes. Let's dive right in. Now, we are using Dragonfly 4.1, this, so this will be the standard out-of-the-box experience with Dragonfly 4.1. The topics we can expect to cover today, what is a mesh? Um, so we are, uh, scientific application for scientific imaging. And so we're gonna deal with the question now, not about images, but about meshes. We will look at rendering mesh, how you might change the color, the lighting, the shadow, the transparency, how you can look at solid renderings versus outlined renderings, etc. We will look very, very briefly at uh, generating a contour mesh. And of course, we're looking at importing mesh files. We'll also look at visualizing data on a mesh with a tool in Dragonfly called the Measurement Inspector. And finally, uh, along the way, we'll show you how you can save a mesh in the ORS object format. All right, now let's, let's, uh, let's get started. Before we go over to Dragonfly, we're gonna download our first data set. And that data set is coming from MorphoSource. So the MorphoSource is a repository for scientists to share their scientific imaging and their uh, imaging and their mesh data. So this is hosted um, primarily at Duke University by Doug Boyer and colleagues. So be sure to check it out. The data set I'm gonna show you comes, it is a, a uh, Creative Commons licensed data set provided by the National Museum of the National Museum of Natural History. So thank you, Smithsonian, for sharing those data. The data set we're going to look at is um, under this MorphoSource identifier. If you want to find the same data set that I'm going to work with right now, you could just uh, enter these terms into Google. So if I just copy MorphoSource Morpho 104845 and I go over to Google and I do a search. Uh, Whoops, that was the wrong paste. I meant to copy this, control C, go over to Google and enter that. And uh, the top hit you'll get here will be the Smithsonian Open Data Access page. And when we log in, you'll see that this is a collection of 2,100 mesh files uh, generously hosted on MorphoSource. Now, in order to download data from MorphoSource, you do have to create an account. A lot of the data are protected. You have to get access from the scientist in charge, the curator of that particular specimen before you can download it. These data are generously available for anybody who creates an account and logs in. The data set that I'm using is this data set right here. So it's the one marked 10485, I think. Uh, yes, 104845. And I think this is, uh, you know, I'm not a zoologist, what do you call the, that mandible? I think this is a mandible from, uh, maybe from a gorilla? Uh, maybe from a bear? Sorry, I don't know. Anyway, you can uh, go click through here and click uh, this add button and then download. You'll be able to download this directly when you're logged in. So I'm in Dragonfly. Let me uh, reset my Dragonfly session. So this is what Dragonfly looks like when you first turn it on. And what I'll be doing now is I'll be coming over here. Got to get my zoom controls out of the way. Coming over here, going to file. And yesterday we did import image files. Today we're going to do import mesh files. And I'm gonna to browse to that file I just downloaded. That's this one right here. Now, when you download it from MorphoSource, it will be in a zip file. You can unzip it, extract it out, 
And this is a .ply, that's one of the file formats in which you can encode a mesh file. I believe that these mesh files have different ways of encoding pixel sizes and sometimes they're not accurate. I'm pretty sure that this mandible is not uh, 52 meters wide. So we may have to save that for another session about how do you adjust the pixel size or I shouldn't say the pixel size, but the scale. So we are looking at a mesh. We're scrolling through and we're looking at different slices of a mesh. If this is your first mesh, you'll notice that it's an outline and there's really nothing inside the outline. It's just an outline. Now, I say it's an outline, that's what it looks like in 2D. If I scroll down to the layout and we do a 3D or a multi-view, now you can see what the mesh looks like in 3D. I'm gonna double click to go full screen. An image is a set of pixels. A mesh is a tessellation. Now, what I mean by tessellation is this is really just composed of a bunch of vertices connected by edges, which ultimately form triangles. Now, what all that means is, for example, if I come over here, you'll see that when I click on this, I don't see the image property panels I saw yesterday. Instead, I see the mesh property panels. And under mesh settings, if I switch this from solid to outlined, there you go. That's what a mesh is. A mesh is this tessellated surface. It is just a surface. There's nothing inside. If we dig inside, we'll see that the other side of the surface and it's just empty inside. So it is a surface model and that's all it is and there are different ways of rendering it in dragonfly so it can be outlined or the default is solid or for that matter you could switch it from solid to wireframe and now you just see the edges connecting those vertices so scientists sometimes like to use meshes to look at their data and it's a way of visualizing it also can be a way of, of doing some modeling applications I'm not going to spend time today telling you the pros and cons of using meshes. This is just an introduction to the idea that in addition to working with images, you can work with meshes. All right, so uh, we're, we're done looking at that mandible. Maybe someone can tell me later if, if we were actually looking at a gorilla mandible or a bear mandible, because I don't know. All right, um, let's hide that and let's look at another data set. In this case, I'm going to load the same image data set that we worked with yesterday. So I'm gonna to go to recent data sets and I'm gonna choose the fracture in granite. So this is a stack of TIFF files. This is the data that was, um, that was stored on the Digital Rocks portal repository. This data are from, I should say, these data are from Rich Ketchum at UT. And I'm gonna enter the pixel size. And so exactly the same data we looked at yesterday. And let's turn it on, and there we are. So if I have a data set like this, an image data set, and I wish to compute a mesh, one way of computing a mesh is simply to right click on the data set and find generate contour mesh. I'm gonna leave the default prepper properties or the default settings for this. I'm just gonna click export to a mesh, and it's computed a mesh. So now I have this data set, and then I have the contour mesh of that data set. I hide the image data set and I show the mesh. Let's make sure that is centered, very good. There we are. So this has created a data set. I've lost all of the information about the different pixels, the different intensities. All I have is this interface really between uh, my solid material and the air. So again, if we switch the rendering from solid to outlined, then you can see Yep, it's a bunch of triangles. It's just a tessellated surface. Now, if we switch it back to solid, you'll also see there is an opacity, so we could sort of see what, is, what does that fracture look like in 3D. So we can see where that fracture goes throughout this 3D spatial domain. That's a little bit on transparency. You can also change the color of the mesh. You can click on this color tile here. You get a swatch, so we could make it uh, whatever color we need it to be. Um, and hit okay. Yep, so that's changing the color. Now you also can smooth meshes. This works well for meshes you generated inside Dragonfly. Doesn't always work so well for other meshes and that is really a complicated topic we can cover offline of which meshes can be smooth and which can't. But if I hit smooth, it's gonna do some smoothing. So you can see some of this rough surface and I can smooth it a few times and I, things have gotten a lot smoother. So. That is a look at a contour mesh that was generated from an image data set. Now we're gonna grab one more mesh online. So if we go back to Google, it, there are public repositories of 3D models. So there's a public repository called Thingiverse where you could download uh, uh, surface models like these meshes that you might wanna use for 3D printing. Now if I type, uh, Thingiverse, floppy, dragonfly, then it'll take me to this guy right here. And it is 
Uh, actually, it's it's this. I don't know if you guys can see the camera. I'm holding up a, a printed version of this. My son printed for me last last summer. So this is a plastic dragonfly. If you click download all files, then you can download these specific files for importing into dragonfly. So I've already downloaded them. And if I go to import mesh files and I browse and I find a floppy dragonfly and I click OK. Now this is an STL file. That's a very common file format. And I turn it on. So there we are. There is my dragonfly. And just as before, we can change the color. We can change the transparency. So I'll make that guy uh, green. And there's my green dragonfly looking pretty good. Oh, let's make it blue. Let's make it a blue. And you have all of the normal 3D visualization tools at your disposal. So if I come over here, I might uh, adjust the lighting or shadowing. I might zoom in. I'm using a middle mouse drag to zoom in. And you have some other uh, cool things like eye candy. So if I'm, I'm looking over here on this panel called scene view properties and at the bottom, I can enable depth of focus. And so I can say, let's turn off autofocus and let's set the focal distance very close and short. And now I can see what's near me and uh, what's far has a little bit of bouquet. So make my rendering a little, a little cool. Now I've turned off the focus. Now we're going to do one more mesh. This is a mesh that I have computed in Dragonfly. I will post it online on our uh, data repository later today. Let me show you where I'm going to post it. Um, you will find it. Let's go here. If you were to go to ORS Dragonfly, then um, you'll find something like this. And if you just go to the, the landing page for Dragonfly, you will find a tab for learn and at the bottom is sample data sets. The data set that I'm gonna use uh, in just a moment, I will post here today so that you can download it for yourself. So the data set is a mesh file and you know, let's import a mesh file. It's a mesh file that has data encoded on it. So this data um, was made in Dragonfly and it was made, let's turn on the visibility, and then we'll select it and center it. Oh, it's already centered. This was made in Dragonfly. This was one of the first micro CT data sets I ever found online. And this was published by the NIST Visible Cement data set, maybe between 15 and 20 years ago. It's all in the public domain, so you can download it and do whatever you want with it. What I did is I segmented some grains and I made some measurements on them and I encoded them all in this mesh. So I have this mesh over here. If I right click, I can ask for Dragonfly's measurement inspector. So this mesh is just like the others. It's a tessellated surface, but each vertex has a measurement. And so in this case, I have encoded not just sort of this label of of grain one, grain two, grain three, but in, I have actual measurements, like if I choose volume, my laptop, it takes a moment to load. And now we're looking at volume. So I'm gonna change the lookup table to this. So what we have now on screen is the largest grain, some 240 microns in, uh, in volume is in red and the small grains are in purple. If I want this to be a little more readable, I might uh, set that color bar to go from say zero to 250. Um, and now it's a little easier to read down here. Now this is quite nice. I'm gonna uh, deselect this checkbox and I'm gonna turn uh, out of window rendering to a lower opacity. And so now I can highlight certain grains and they'll have higher opacity or I can set everything down and we can look at the small grains or the big grains. And so we can interrogate these different measurements. And so I've got volume loaded up, but I could also do surface area since that's something I've computed. Now, as soon as I do surface area, I'm gonna get a new histogram because of course it does not have the same units as volume. So I've got new histogram, new units, and I can do uh, exactly what I was doing before. So we can look at the small surface area grains or the large surface area grains, or we could look at everything except the large surface area grains. That's kind of a, a neat little tool. So what we have here is we have a mesh that has measurements encoded on the vertices and Dragonfly has the capability of creating those meshes and saving them. I don't think I showed you how to save a mesh today. So um, I meant to do that on the mesh that we created here. So not this one, but this one. What? Yeah, so if you wanted to save a mesh, you can always right click and go export as ORS object and then uh, hit save. And now everything is there. So if you follow one of my future lessons where we make a mesh like this, you can save it as an ORS object and it'll have all of the values encoded on the vertices.
Okay, I think that's everything that we wanted to cover today. And we did it in less than 20 minutes. So we're a little closer to on time. Now, let me see if I can pull up your questions and answers. And that's what we're gonna do now is go into the question and answers period. So let's see, all right. Um, all right, uh, first question I see is how does Dragonfly choose where to build the mesh? Now, what I did today is I did a generate contour mesh and it uses an ISO contour or an ISO thresholding routine. Basically, it looks at every pixel and if you set a threshold of 100 and you have a pixel that is uh, 120 units and the pixel next to it is 80 units, then that means that between those two pixels, you're crossing over that threshold. And so effectively, everywhere you have that situation met, it'll plot a triangle. And so it's everywhere the interface goes from below the threshold to above the threshold, it plots a triangle. And so that's what you're doing, this contouring along one threshold. So that's the ISO contour mesh. All right, next question. Can you find a location in 3D from 2D slices? Yes, you can. I'll cover that, I think, after we upgrade to 2020.1. So we may have to wait a, a week or two on how to show that in Dragonfly. Next question. Is there a way to change the data by flipping vertically instead of just visualization? I think I understand the question. I'm going to show you that. That's a good question. So uh, the data set, now it's very, very nuanced as to what's happening here. Now, this data set, if we go up and this is the zero, zero position. And if I use what I showed yesterday uh, up here and I just do a vertical flip, well, I'm showing it, this is still the zero, zero position. Dragonfly is just, is just viewing the zero, zero position down here instead of up here. So it's just changing the way it's viewed. This is very subtle. You can say, well, I need this to be my zero, zero pixel, and I need this to be my uh, NX uh, zero pixel, so, uh, or my NZ comma zero pixel. If you need to do that inversion on the data, you can, you can right click on your image channel and go to invert. Let's see, um, in Dragonfly 4.1, you're gonna find modify and transform invert. This menu right here, uh, data set inverter will allow you to invert about an axis. So in this case, we flipped vertically, we flipped um, along the Y axis, so we could do a flip and apply. And we'll have a new data set or we could just overwrite the existing data set. Next question is, uh, when we import files from a fib slices stack, do I use the slice distance for Z or the same as for X and Y? What we suggest is if you have a data set where you're doing three nanometer pixels in X and Y, and you're doing five nanometers per slice on the milling, then you would do three by three by five. If you think you have slightly different slice depths, like slice one may be 5.2 nanometers and slice two might be uh, 4.9 nanometers, if that Z slice thickness is non-constant, Dragonfly doesn't really have a solution for that. If you are running on a Zeiss crossbeam microscope that can track, if you're using Atlas 3D and you can track the slice thickness, it also has the tools for, uh, for reinterpolating to a fixed grid, I believe. Next question, can you encode measurements in the mesh? Yes, that's really uh, too long for me to answer in the Q&A. You can encode measurements in the mesh and we'll have a slight introduction to that in Thursday's webinar on uh, introduction to multiroids and segmentation. Um, next question, um, do, 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 that's the same question on uh, fib slice thickness. Can Dragonfly handle floating image data with lots of zeros such as 10 to the minus sixth? Great question, you can import image data and it can be float data type and uh, there's not that constraint with zeros. So it can be single precision floating point, if you know what that means, but not double precision floating point. So Dragonfly can import those data. Next question, can we convert 3D surface mesh that has SDL extension to 3D solid volume mesh? So the answer is no, Dragonfly does not have solid meshing tools. So if you had a surface mesh and then you wanted to do a, a 3D subdivision into like an Altet or a mixed polyhedra mesh, um, Dragonfly doesn't offer those tools today. There are some public domain tools and then there are of course tools like Geomagic and Poly, I, I, don't, I, I don't know the tool, tool chain for that. So Dragonfly is not um, going down the road right now of solid meshing. We may entertain that in the future. 
Next question, do you need to determine your surface before generating the mesh? Yes, so when we look at the idea of image segmentation, that's the way you get a, a nice precise mesh that reflects the data. What we did here is we basically performed a naive segmentation with ISO contouring. So that was just to do a very quick lesson. So let's do two more questions and then we'll break for the day. Uh, how is an image converted to a contour mesh? Is this an ISO 50 type of surface detection or a simple thresholding? So it is just a thresholding. In fact, it's right here. The threshold is set and that's what determines the, ISO con the, the, the threshold for ISO contouring. And last question, what's the point of a mesh? I wish I knew. Um, uh, well, it's a complicated question. I work almost always in the image domain. I think that's richest. Um, many, many scientists like looking at meshes, but I don't necessarily know I can tell you why. You may have to talk to those scientists. I think a lot of them think the rendering is a better rendering quality, but you're gonna see with our next generation rendering quality, you really have no need to go to meshes if you're just trying to get a better rendering. Um, another reason is people like having that uh, surface model that they can smooth. You could make an argument that the mesh itself is higher resolution than the intrinsic image data. It's a complicated argument, but you could say you're getting higher resolution. A lot of people that are doing morphometrics, that are doing comparative anatomy and doing sort of uh, phylogenetics by comparing different uh, anatomical specimens, they like working in the mesh domain. All right, I'm gonna wrap up the Q&A. Feel free to ask questions on the forums. Feel free to ask questions uh, by email. We may not be able to get to them. We do have a lot of people attending these webinars. All right, look for this webinar on YouTube if you're, not, if, you're not, if you're watching it live. And if you're already watching on YouTube, hit the like button so we know this is content, the sort of content you like. And please, please hit the subscribe button. That way we know that people are interested in generating more content. So come back tomorrow and we'll talk about graphs. Then on Thursday, we'll talk about uh, working with multi roys for segmentation, and then lesson five this week will be on Movie Maker. Great, thanks everybody for your time. Have a great day, and uh, take care and stay healthy.